It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I uh, when 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 Linda said I'm from Washington D.C., I like to correct that right away. It's I'm from Virginia because you never know what people will think when you say you're from Washington D.C. It's it's 64 square miles of fantasy surrounded by reality. And, uh, and sometimes we think it's Disneyland on the Potomac. But, uh, it is great to be in Wisconsin. Uh, we got a cold wave coming through. My only, I try to avoid politics, and so I hope nothing I say today will be viewed as political. My one, only political comment is to say it was so cold when I left Washington that even Bernie Sanders, he had his hands in his own pockets. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, I, I did grow up in Wauwatosa, and uh, it was a great place to grow up, and uh, the connection here, if you can see this, is, uh, and it's bright, so if you can't see it, it's fine. I did bring a few slides I think I'll show, but my father was minister of the First Congregational Church of Wauwatosa. That's why I see familiar faces here of people who attended that church. And he had hosted a dinner one evening uh, that included uh, Wally Davis over here, Bill Law and, and Bob Baird, who are members of his church and friends, and uh, it was, it was at that dinner where I think the idea of Brookfield Academy was floated and starting a school back in you know, the early 1960s. Uh, Bill Law was a big influence on me and my thinking, a remarkable man, and uh, as, as were Wally Davis and, and Bob Baird. And uh, then they hired Bill Smith as your first head of school, and he was the son of friends of my grandparents in Illinois. I didn't know him well, but uh, it was through that connection that uh, this school was founded. I think there was some discussion initially of perhaps having the school meet in the First Congregational Church, because they had Sunday school rooms that were available on weekdays, but my dad wasn't keen on the idea of a school operating out of the church. So they purchased this land, and wow, it's incredible to be here this morning and see the facility that's, that's here today. I did, I, I uh, here we go. The, uh, so Brookfield Academy has a special place in my heart. Uh, the, uh, I never attended here. My mother had hoped I would, and I wasn't too keen about the distance from Wauwatosa and leaving friends I had there, so I effectively resisted that idea. But my cousin, Kathy uh, Willie, attended here, and I, I, she was in Savannah, Georgia, and I told her I'd be out here. She said she was out a few years ago for her 25th reunion and, and the great experience she had. But a little more interesting is the fact that uh, just uh, about a month ago, after I knew I was coming here, I went to a deli in Washington, very close to where my office is at DuPont Circle, and I <laughs> ordered my sandwich, and there was another gentleman who just ordered his sandwich ahead of me, and he had a Packers t-shirt on. So while we were waiting, of course, I said, oh, are you a Packer fan? He said, yes. I said, are you from Wisconsin? He said, yeah, I'm from, I uh, grew up in Brookfield. <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm going out there to Brookfield Academy to speak in, in a month. Uh, and he said, that's where I went. Oh. And I said, oh, well, uh, he said he went there through 10th grade and then his family moved to Utah. And uh, I said, oh, I'm looking forward to going out there. And he says, yeah, as a matter of fact, I have the five stars tattooed on my arm. Oh. <laughs> oh, my I think he said that in jest. <laughs> But he talked to me about the great experience he had here, and then he said he spent his last three years of high school in Utah in a public school, and you can tell the difference by having had that experience. But it was just a, it was one of those small world experiences. And the other thing about Brookfield Academy that really influenced my life profoundly, really, was when I was looking for a college, graduating from Wauwatosa East, my mother told me that Bob Drez, who was teaching English here at the time, had suggested I look at Vanderbilt University. And I did want to kind of go away from home, so I went down to Vanderbilt at his suggestion, toured the campus, loved it, and ended up going there as a student. And it was at Vanderbilt where I met a gentleman by the name of David Jones. David was the founder, one of the founders of the Fund for American Studies, where I work today, and uh, encouraged me to go to Washington to a Fund for American Studies summer program. And uh, you know, it ended up being a place I went to work 15 years later and spent most of my career at. So 
if Bob Drez hadn't mentioned Vanderbilt, I'd probably be on a whole different path in my life. So uh, I think, you know, you have the metrics, so you know what a great school this is. You can look at, you know, the, the SAT scores, ACP scores, the place, the kinds of colleges and universities the students here go to, what they learn, and about the five stars and the character that's developed here. I know how wonderful it is. I uh, thought I'd... Uh, start with a great quote I came across from Frederick Douglass in a speech he gave just months before he died in 1894. Uh, he was talking about the importance of education. He said, education means emancipation. It means light and liberty. It means the uplifting of the soul of man into the glorious light of truth, the light only by which men can be free. And of course, he meant men and women, but uh, I thought that was just the great connection there, of education being about light and liberty. Uh, and I think that's a great descriptor of Brookfield Academy and the five stars and what a quality education is all about. Uh, I often tell my staff, as well as students come to our programs, I share this quote from Plutarch who supposedly said that the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. And I, I love that line. And I emphasize that you know we our job isn't to provide students with propaganda and fill their minds with ideas that you know we think are the right ideas, but it's to kindle a fire in their uh, spark, uh, get their intellectual curiosity uh, going, so that they will uh, think about things they see, be good observers, come to good conclusions, and I think that's why Douglas tied together this idea of light and liberty. Uh, I, you know, was just, in preparing for this, I, I was coming over, after, uh, coming across quotation after quotation of founders, the framers of our Constitution, the founders of our country, talking about the importance <clears throat> of an educated citizenry and saying it was indispensable to the success of the American experiment of liberty. Jefferson wrote, uh, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it expects what never was and never will be. Another founder, Benjamin Rush, learning is favorable to liberty. Freedom can exist only in a society of knowledge. Without learning, men are incapable of knowing their rights, and where learning is confined to a few people, liberty can neither be equal or universal. And on and on, Madison, the advancement and diffusion of knowledge is the only guardian of true liberty. Uh, and that's why I think uh, this focus on the five stars of character, truth, heritage, individuality, and intellect are so vital because they are the foundation of a free society. <coughs> the, uh, so what I thought I'd do this morning is just talk a little bit about our founding, a little bit about, uh, uh, especially because as many of you know, you know, there are efforts today to undermine the ideas of our founding. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, have heard of the 1619 Project that the New York Times has been pushing, uh, which changes our narrative to one of a country founded basically by white supremacists who are trying to perpetuate slavery. And they've just come out with a new book. Uh, I stopped at Barnes & Noble last night at Brookfield Square, and it's featured there, this new book uh, that the New York Times has come out with. This, It's an attack on the idea of capitalism, and it's a view that our country's white supremacist, and they're pushing this, and it's getting into schools. Uh, they're putting out curriculum on this subject in schools. And then there's uh, you know, critical race theory. We hear a lot about where I live in Virginia, in Loudoun County, Virginia, parents are fighting back against critical race theory in the schools. And uh, so uh, I thought I'd talk a little bit about our founding ideas and, and, and what I think is the narrative that we need to make sure we're passing along to the next generation. Because we are an experiment in liberty, and experiments can fail. They don't automatically continue unless we teach the right lessons, the right values to the rising generation. Well, it was a remarkable event that happened in 1776. And, uh, the great thing about it now, looking back on it, I think, is the framers of our uh, the, the, the founders of our country gave us a vision statement, 
and they gave us a mission statement. And they're right there in the founding documents of the country for us to look at and reflect on. And the uh, preamble of the Constitution refers to us as uh, in order to form a more perfect union. And I agree with scholars who say that's recognition, that we, we weren't a perfect country at our founding. We obviously weren't. We allowed slavery to continue, despite the fact that most of the framers of the Constitution opposed slavery while owning slaves. But if you look at that vision statement, it, it, it's remarkable. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's the vision in the Declaration of Independence. And then the mission, stated very clearly in the Constitution, is that we, the people of the United States, in order to form, for six, the, the mission was to accomplish six things. In order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. We do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States. So I thought we could look at a little bit this morning is kind of how we're doing, uh, where, where things stand today. And uh, again, I, I think you know there was a, an event in Washington about 10 years ago, and a, a lot of people there who were kind of free market oriented we're talking about the founding, and they're saying, boy, our country was founded. We were this free country, and ever since then, government's been growing, and we're losing our freedom. And in the room was Associate Justice of Supreme Court Clarence Thomas. And he said, I have a very different take on this story you're telling. We were at our utmost freedom in, 19, in 1787. Uh, people with my skin color were slaves at the time. <coughs> We've seen a lot of improvement. So I think it, it, it's a mixed story. For women and blacks, we've seen a, a tremendous amount of improvement over our 250-year history. Uh, even despite uh, the growth of government in our lives, the fact that we face more regulation, it's a very mixed story. Uh, I, I, I saw the other day, it took us 193 years in this country to accumulate our first $1 trillion of debt. And in the last 50 years, we've accumulated another $29 trillion of debt. So we definitely have some very serious, I think, financial issues and problems to deal with. Uh, I think it's very alarming to see the uh, fact that the separation of powers, which was so vital to our framers in controlling the growth of government, has pretty much disappeared. Uh, we now have the administrative state, which tends to be both the it, it's the legislative branch, the administrative branch, executive branch, and the uh, judicial branch, where government agencies write the regulations, they enforce the regulations, and they adjudicate disagreements about the regulations. You see that with OSHA, with this new vaccine mandate, where they issue the mandate, Congress didn't pass it, uh, a government agency issued a mandate, uh, they're going to enforce it, and they're going to adjudicate and lay the fines on companies who they think violate it. Now, it may be overturned in the courts. But in agency after agency, you have this blending of these three powers of government that were supposed to be kept separate. And, and that's very much a concern. Well, let me just follow along on a few things here. This is the great thing about our founding is that uh, Margaret Thatcher said, Europe will never be like America. Europe is a product of history. America is a product of philosophy. And I do think that sets us apart. We're basically the only country in history that was founded on a set of ideas. The idea that we are all created equal and endowed by our rights from our creator. The government doesn't grant our rights. Uh, we are endowed with them uh, as humans with dignity. I, I, I found this picture of me with Margaret Thatcher. I had the chance, the great opportunity to meet a few times. Uh, this was at Parliament in London, and I wrote a woman in a tea bag because she told me a story there. She's telling me this story, and I don't remember exactly who, who she told it to. It was, I think she said she told this to Gorbachev once, that you must remember that a woman is like a tea bag. 
you don't know how strong she is until she gets into hot water. Certainly a strong woman. Uh, so Randy Barnett, who's a scholar at Georgetown and teaches in some of our programs, he, he captured it with this uh, once. He said, a constitution is the law that governs those who govern us. If you read the constitution, it's not a law imposed on all of us as citizens. It's a document that governs the people in power in, in Washington. Article 1 gives Congress 18 enumerated powers it can deal with. Uh, Article 2 covers the presidency, uh, the Supreme Court. The Constitution is the law that governs those who govern us. It doesn't govern us as citizens. Jefferson, in his first inaugural, uh, captured the three functions of government. A wise and frugal government should restrain men from injuring one another. That's the really defense and the police function. Leave them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement. And not take from the mouth of labor the bread it has earned, the taxation power. This is the sum of good government, a very limited government. So have we succeeded? Now Jefferson said the natural progress of things is for liberty to yield and government to gain ground. And at any given point in time, you're either going in the direction of more government or in the direction of more liberty. You aren't standing still. And I was at the, the Museum of African American History a few weeks ago, and I saw this. I took this picture, and I thought it was a great. They had a series of these quotations. Whether freemen or slaves, the colored race in this country have always looked to the United States as the promised land of universal freedom. Frederick Douglass and others who really believed the Declaration of Independence was the beacon for enslaved and newly freed Americans. Their, their freedom was found in that declaration, even though we didn't live up to that promise initially. Now we get to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's what the pursuit of happiness looks like. And this is where I connect to what I learned from Bill Law. Uh, the pursuit of happiness is economic freedom. Bill Law, when he gave a lecture, he would start over this end of the room, and he would say, this is the standard of living in the world. The, world GDP, or however you want to say it, from earliest existence of man on this earth, the standard of living stayed about here. It stayed about here. And you hit a little bump here and there from the Stone Age or the Bronze Age. And then you got to about 1700. And all of a sudden, we went like this. So what was it that caused this hockey stick of growth in the world economy, starting in really the English-speaking countries of Europe, world GDP took off. We live really at subsistence levels in poverty for the most part until, uh, let's say, 1700. And all of a sudden, we started to have more commerce. We started to have more wealth being created. And you can see here just key events along the way. Whoops. But what we had in about 17th century was Enlightenment ideas and the Industrial Revolution, starting in England and in the United States. We led the way, of course. And there was escape from global poverty. This is poverty in the world. And the World Bank estimates by, this is before the pandemic, which may have changed, <coughs> but by about 2030, there will be no more poverty in the world based on their definition of poverty, which is like $2 of income a day. Uh, they estimate that we'll see the elimination of poverty and growth of GDP. And all this happened while the world population was growing enormously. So wealth is expanding, everyone's getting richer, even though the number of people in the world has expanded tremendously. This, this I love, it's from the Cato Institute. That could be the headline of the paper every day since about 1990. The number of people in extreme poverty fell yesterday by 370,000. And that's happened every day for 25 years. 
uh, 1.2 billion people since 1990 lifted out of poverty in China and India and other countries in the world. Uh, we're seeing this growth that, and again, this is pre-pandemic, which has slowed down these trends, but uh, it's, it's remarkable. I can remember growing up and seeing, you know, National Geographic, some kids in Africa who were emaciated from droughts and, uh, and while that still happens, it's nowhere like it used to be. Uh, and then when you survey people, and we do this with our students when they arrive, uh, they don't know anything about this. They think most of the world lives in poverty. I mean, they ask, this is the question they asked, 12,000 people in 14 countries. In the last 20 years, the proportion of the world population living in extreme poverty has A, almost doubled, B, stayed the same, C, almost halved. Whoops. When I touch the screen, it seems to move. <laughs> so that's high tech. <laughs> uh, the answer is C. It's the proportion of people living in poverty is almost halved. So randomly, you get 33%. Right, if you asked 12,000 people this, you'd think a third would get it right just by guessing. Well, in, in you know, 5% of Americans think we've reduced poverty in the world. Our students don't understand that. Uh, and uh, you know, the Swedes and the Norwegians seem to know things better than we do. But life expectancy and all these metrics, I'm not going to share most of them, uh, over the past 25, 50 years. Uh, life expectancy in 1900 was about 45, uh, and now it's 80, I think, somewhere around 80 uh, in the U.S. And in the world, it's just incredible uh, what's happened with life expectancy. Life expectancy at birth is way up in the freest countries, much more than the, the least, least free countries. A lot of these metrics you can show based on how free a country is. But the quality of uh, the environment's better in these countries, uh, all these <coughs> measures. I love telling these stories uh, as well to our students. Uh, you all know who Henry David Thoreau was, author of Walden. Uh, he had an older brother, two years older than him. They were best friends growing up uh, in New England. They would go out in the woods every day together. Uh, he, Henry David Thoreau loved his older brother, John. And uh, when John was uh, 27, he cut himself shaving one morning. And he died from it. Uh, got infected. And uh, it, it really changed Henry David Thoreau. He, he was really hit hard, as you would expect from that. But in 1842, you could die cutting, by mm -hmm. cutting yourself shaving. Mm -hmm. And uh, flash. Uh, Fast forward to when Calvin Coolidge was president. That's his son, Calvin Coolidge Jr. One day he decided to go with his brother on the tennis courts at the White House and play tennis. He got a blister on his foot playing tennis. It turned into a staph infection. He was taken to Walter Reed Hospital and he died from it. Calvin Coolidge lost his son. Another tragic event. But that's what you had to face uh, in, at, at that time. And that was what, 19. I think 1917 or something. He was 12 years old, I believe. Uh, so healthcare has improved dramatically. Literacy has improved dramatically. Uh, let me see if I can get this to work. We did a video about, uh, I'm just going to show you two minutes of it. Uh, this is Michael Cox, who's an economist with the Dallas Fed. And uh, uh, will this work or do you No, I'll it? do it when you tell me. I'm going to go like this one. I want you to stop okay. it. No. So okay. You can start it now. Imagine a place where people are so poor that almost no one has electricity or indoor plumbing. By modern standards of Americans, people here live in abject poverty. Conditions are such that people cannot afford refrigerators or washing machines, not to mention cell phones or computers. There's no access to the internet. People work six to seven days a week with little or no vacation time just to feed and clothe their families. Cars are rare and no one has air conditioning or television. 
Healthcare is primitive with infant mortality high and death from disease routine. No one has access to antibiotics or even aspirin. Where is this undeveloped third world country, you ask? Then he asks, where is this place that he's talking about? Does anyone know? Some of them know. This place that's so poor and that people don't well, have all these things we enjoy today. Yeah, it's the United States, 100 years ago. Oh. <laughs> it's a trick question. Yes, that's a but trick. But just play it forward. Just right here in America, just 100 years ago. That was then, this is now a century later, with a vast array of goods and services, shorter work weeks, better health, much longer lifespans, abundant variety, and better jobs. Where did all this progress come from? In a word, markets. As Americans, we've all benefited immeasurably from the freedom and competition that markets naturally bring. The inherent desire to make a better life for ourselves and our family has powered incentives for us to learn, to invent, to innovate, be productive on the job, save, invest, lend, start companies, hire others, and take business risks. Americans have raised their living standards to levels that were previously unimaginable. Even the poorest among us today live better than the kings and queens and so-called robber barons of just a century ago. Let's do this slide here, but uh, this, this the interesting thing here is that uh, you start with things that were invented early in the century, electricity, uh, a range, a refrigerator, a radio. Uh, you know, this is the extent to which what percentage of Americans own a, a refrigerator, for instance, or, or a, uh, a color television, a telephone? And what you find on this chart and the data he's done is that it may take 25, 30, 40 years for 90% of Americans to, to have electricity, own a refrigerator, own a color television. But as you move forward and you start looking at the air conditioning, washer, dryer, cell phone, the penetration rate moves so much faster. <clears throat> cell phones, we went from their early invention to 90% of Americans owning them in about 15 years. And uh, so we're, we're, we're seeing this. He likes to say when a new product comes out, like the old bulky cell phones that came out initially, the richest people in our country get in the front of the line and they buy them first. And they paid $8,000 to get this bulky product with no computing power. And then the process for all these things, the products get cheaper and better. And uh, pretty soon, 90% plus of Americans own them. And today, you know, in your cell phone has the computing power, you know, far beyond, you know, what the early Apollo spacecraft had. I, I, I continue to just marvel at my cell phone. Um, I, if I wanted to, I could take it out now and I could lower the temperature in my house in Virginia. My wife will probably call and complain. It's cold. But I can, I can control my thermostat. I have an app now where whenever I see a pretty plant or flower, I can take a picture of it and it tells me what it is. I can record the sound of a bird I hear. It'll tell me what kind of bird that is and show the migratory patterns of that bird. Uh, my entire music collection, all my photos that I keep on my phone. It's just, it's remarkable what phones can do. And, uh, you know, their, their, their power is growing every year in terms of its capacity to help us in our lives. Even, you know, cars are remarkable too. The, the key fobs now that will move your seat so it goes to where you want it versus when your wife uses her fob, it moves it back forward to where she wants it. I mean, this is, we are so blessed in terms of our material wealth. Uh, and this is all a bottom-up process of entrepreneurs in their garages, trying things uh, and uh, failing, and trying again and failing again. It's all very bottom-up. Uh, I love the story of iPencil. Anyone know that story? A few of you do. Google it and read it. It's on the internet. You can even find video versions of it, but I encourage you to read it and have your kids read it. Leonard Reed, who uh, was the president of the Foundation for Economic Education, Bill Law, one of the founders here, served on his board and was a regular lecturer in the seminars he put on. He wrote this essay, I Pencil, and he talks about something 
he talks about a pencil. It has six, there's six ingredients to this. The wood, the graphite, the paint or lacquer, the uh, band, metal band, the eraser, and then he said a label, which here was printed with a different color ink, I guess. Uh, and yet it takes thousands and thousands of people voluntarily cooperating in a bottom-up process to produce this simple thing of a pencil. You need people in steel mills to make the saws that the lumberjacks use to cut down the cedar to make the wood in this pencil. You need chemists and others to work to develop the lacquer. Uh, you need uh, truckers. Uh, you need, you know, this. Uh, some of the products come from other countries around the world. So people who don't know each other, probably wouldn't even get along if they met each other, <laughs> are all cooperating to make this pencil. Uh, our, one of our professors prefers the example of the toothbrush. She gives all our students a toothbrush at the end of the program and says, you take something as simple as a toothbrush, go to your toothbrush aisle at your grocery store. They've got so many varieties. They've got Spider-Man toothbrushes, and <laughs> all the superheroes. They've got all different hard, soft bristles, multiple varieties of toothbrushes for us. They come from, they're usually produced in countries in the third world, and yet we buy them, open them up, and put them in our mouth. Mm. We don't seem to care where they came from. Mm. We stick them in our mouth every night and brush our teeth with them. And it's, it's, it is a remarkable process. There's no one directing it from above. It's all done through the voluntary actions of people trying to make their lives better. And that gives us all these toothbrushes that we have. Uh, I, I, I often like to say that uh, this process of markets, of all you need is prices that send the signals to people, property rights, so they can benefit from what they do, and profits and losses that tell them they aren't using their resources properly. And because of that, you have a world where, and, uh, you know, paraphrasing from the Bible, because of this, today, the blind can see the deaf can hear and the lame can walk. Mm -hmm. And that is literally true. There are people who were born without the ability to hear that cook their implants that enable them to hear now. There are people who are blind who now can have cataract surgeries and other treatments to enable them to keep their vision. And there are lots of people who could not walk, but for modern medicine, uh, including many veterans of wars that have that ability still today. And people who get knee replacements and hip replacements, it's a, it's a miracle that all this happens through this bottom-up process of nobody directing it. Nobody's telling anyone what we need to do. Well, I, I had, I've been blessed in my career to travel extensively in Eastern and Central Europe. Here I am with Lech Walesa, who led the Solidarity Movement in Poland. I, my, I took a job with the Fund for American Studies in uh, 1991, and uh, they never worked internationally, and the first thing the board told me is we want to set up a program in Europe. The Berlin Wall is down. Uh, we want to go over there and help educate kids in Eastern Central Europe. So I went with the dean from Georgetown University and two board members, and we traveled the region, and we established a program there. And uh, I met uh, lots, uh, Lech Valenza. I met Mark Lahr, the leader of a lot of the freedom movement in Estonia, uh, Václav Havel from then Czechoslovakia, and these were great people I really admired in that, that. So I'm going to connect that to this. This is a grocery store near my house. It's called Wegmans. I hope you have them out here. It's a great grocery store. Do you have them here? No. Oh, it's a wonderful grocery store. It's huge. Its produce is great. I went in there on Saturday to do some grocery shopping, and I took this picture. And I particularly, this is what came to mind. Bananas for 49 cents a pound. Because, and, and there's some of the bananas. They have different types of bananas. I don't know all the names. I know they have plantains. And they have red bananas. I'm not sure. I've never had a red banana. But lots and lots of bananas, and you can get them for 49 cents a pound. Well, Mark Lahr became the first prime minister of free Estonia. And he told me that when he lived under communism, he knew there was something called a banana but he had never had one, and he always wanted a banana growing up. And they didn't have them in Estonia. 
And that was, he said, what inspired him to know there was something better in the world that they needed to try to get in Estonia. <laughs> and then there's another gentleman who grew up in China, Jimmy Lai, great man. Uh, and he talks about being in China once. He was working at a railroad station, carrying people's bags, a porter, as a kid. And a, a Western businessman was there, and he handed him as a tip a piece of chocolate. And he ate this chocolate, and he said, it was heavenly. He said, there must be a better world out there. I want to get there where they have this chocolate, because he never had it in China. He managed to get to Hong Kong. He started Giordano's clothing store, became a very, very wealthy person in Hong Kong and then and in China. And uh, then he bought and got into the media, Apple Daily, biggest paper in Hong Kong. Uh, just a great man, and now he's sitting in a prison in Hong Kong because the Chinese in Beijing have shut down Apple Daily. They've imprisoned the owner, Jimmy Lai, uh, and uh, they're trying, they're, they're uh, going to be trying him for promoting democracy. And uh, uh, hopefully he'll, they'll, once he gets, finally gets sentenced, there'll probably be a free Jimmy Lai movement who will get out his uh, very close ties to Bill McGurn of the Wall Street Journal, who's trying to help him. But it was a piece of chocolate. This is Václav Havel, who I, who I had the great privilege of meeting, who was a dissident, a playwright in Czechoslovakia. And he uh, was a man of the left. Uh, he writes about it in his uh, book called Summer Meditations. He wrote plays. He was imprisoned by the communists. But he still viewed himself as a man of the left. And uh, I wanted to share something from his summer meditations, which I read. Uh, I used it in my Bradley remarks, because it, 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 it just meant a lot to me having met him. He's no longer living. Uh, but he considered himself a socialist, and he became the president, first president of a free Czechoslovakia in 1989. And uh, here's what he wrote. He said, though my heart be left of center, I've always known that the only economic system that works is a market economy in which everything belongs to someone, which means that someone is responsible for everything. Its workings are guided chiefly by the laws of the marketplace. This is the only natural economy, the only kind that makes sense, the only one that can lead to prosperity, because it is the only one that reflects the nature of life itself. The essence of life is infinitely and mysteriously multiform, and therefore it cannot be contained or planned for in its fullness and variability by any central intelligence. <clears throat> but, uh, he, he says he was slow to comprehend this, but uh, he did comprehend it, and he went on to say that attempts to direct economic entities under a single monstrous owner, the government, is hubris an attempt against life itself, a lack of humility before the mysterious order of being. Uh, I just think that's a great passage because of, it's coming from him. Whoops, I'm the wrong way. Uh, and here's Boris Yeltsin. You can Google this story too. He went to see the Johnson Space Center and we tried to impress him with our great space program. We aren't going to impress Russians with our space program. <laughs> they have one too. What if he wanted to go to a grocery store. He said, take me to a grocery I forgot the name of this grocery store in Texas. But, and he went to the frozen food aisle. And he talked about these jello pops that we have. <laughs> and he said, if the people in my country knew you had something like these jello pops, they would revolt. <laughs> <laughs> he had some ship back. Somehow he got them. <laughs> <this over here. laughs> Uh, but we take all this for granted. Young people take all this for granted. Uh, uh, and, and we shouldn't take it for granted. Uh, it's too important to take for granted. The pursuit of happiness, which is another word for economic freedom, is really, I think, the most important freedom most of us enjoy. Uh, it's what matters in our everyday lives as we go to work, as we invest, as we start businesses, as we develop products. Uh, it's this free enterprise system. And, you know, it's, it's people like Bill Law. I had the opportunity to work a summer or two at his leather tanneries in Cudahy. Uh, it was hard work. It was dirty work. And, uh, but he ran a great company. He had 
uh, a great incentives for the workers to work hard in that company. Uh, and uh, it created the wealth that built places like this and other organizations that he supported as an entrepreneur. Philanthropy is a great blessing that we enjoy in this country, but most countries don't have that kind of tradition of philanthropy that builds schools and hospitals and concert halls and all the other things we do with philanthropy. Uh, and uh, so here's my kind of conclusion to all this. Uh, when the Franklin left the Constitutional Convention, here is the diary, uh, a lady named Mrs. Powell asked him, Mr. Franklin, what kind of government have you given us? And he responded, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. A republic, madam, if you can keep it. So that's our challenge. Can we keep our republic? Can we remain a free country? Uh, our constitution is the oldest ever in history. Uh, none have lasted as long as ours. Uh, there's a, a professor who used to teach for us in Georgetown, Walter Burns, great constitutional scholar. He, he made a trip to, to South America. I forgot if it was Brazil or Argentina to give a lecture on the constitution. And someone in the audience raised his hand and challenged him saying, who do you think you are as an American to come here and lecture us on the Constitution? You've only have, had one, and we've had dozens. <laughs> Ours is the oldest Constitution, and this is why we have to keep it. Packer fan? <laughs> I took two of my four grandchildren here uh, with my wife and me. Uh, they're, they're eight months old. I want them to grow up in a country with freedom, with, with good health care, with a uh, comfortable life. So I'll close with a story from Robert Louis Stevenson that I love. Stevenson, tell, the story is told that when he was an infant and he'd sleep in the nursery in his parents' home in Edinburgh, and one night he was had his head pressed against the window looking intently outside. And his parents came in and his father said, what are you looking at to Robert? And he said, it was, this, it was the lamplighter coming down the street lighting the lamps. But he turned and said to his father, there's a man outside punching holes in the darkness. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think, uh, you know, it, it relates to those stars, I think, is this idea of liberty and light. We need to punch holes in the darkness. Uh, and we face it every day in many ways. Uh, that's not just a video, but uh, <laughs> that our job in conversations we have, but it's particularly with our children, in raising our children, uh, but also with our neighbors and in our communities and the many groups we are, uh, we need to talk about the precious nature of the American founding and the importance of these values and not take them for granted because uh, they are very precious. And if we don't do it, uh, we risk losing them. And what does that mean? That means Venezuela. Or North, I had that map of North Korea earlier, uh, of Korea, the Korean Peninsula. It's remarkable, uh, this idea of light again. You look at the South Korea and the satellite picture at night, it's a glow, it's bright with activity and people, human flourishing taking place. You look at North Korea at night in that satellite photo and it's pitch black. Uh, you look at uh, Venezuela. We are sponsoring two young Venezuelans right now who are traveling to college campuses in the U.S. They're both here uh, seeking asylum because they were fighting against Chavez and Maduro in Venezuela. And they're telling the story of Venezuela to young Americans who think socialism is the way to go and talking about how it's destroyed their country. But they've reached a point where he, 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 one of them remarked how when there was a hurricane in North Carolina, some man went out and a boat and rescued these dogs from a kennel that were going to otherwise drown from the flooding. And he, he said, people spend so much money and so much effort to rescue dogs, and in Venezuela, in my country, people are eating their dogs. That's how sad it is there. Uh, but I don't want to leave you on a downer note, but it, it is, it, it, it's a very thin fabric that separates us from a Venezuela. And Venezuela got into this through excessive government spending at a time when they had oil revenues pouring in and they thought they could afford massive government programs. And they eventually, uh, prices of oil fell and the country got into terrible straits and they elected 
a Hugo Chavez, a populist, on a white horse coming in saying, I'll save everyone. And he began by confiscating property, taking over businesses, nationalizing industries, and they were plunged into poverty, and millions and millions of Venezuelans have fled that country as a result of that. So that can be the fate of any country, uh, as rich as ours. Uh, so it's a warning uh, to us, and I think students are waking up to that, thanks to Jorge and Andres going on campuses to do that. Uh, you have brochures about the Fund for American Studies. We offer lots of programs for high school and college students teaching mm -hmm. economics and about American principles. So uh, you can find our website if you have children in, who are in high school who want to go to great week-long summer camps, uh, economics for leaders on college campuses. Uh, we'll do one at Northwestern this summer. We have them at Yale, Rice, SMU. It's a great way to kick the tires of a new campus mm -hmm. uh, that they might be interested in going to. We have programs for college students who spend the summer or semester in Washington. Uh, Working with young people makes me very encouraged. Uh, we have students who come to us who say, I've never ever heard these ideas. I've never heard someone argue against socialism at my school. <laughs> I've heard a woman say that uh, recently uh, in our program. So it's a great way to make them, I think, uh, optimistic about the future as well uh, when they learn about all that we have accomplished with this bottom-up system of free enterprise that we have in this country. Well, I, I probably talked long enough. The one thing, I, I forgot my laptop when I came, and Linda rescued me by <laughs> loading this part on her laptop, but I also forgot my watch, so I thought <laughs> 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 uh, very attentive, so thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have.